Taking a note from James Cameron, Paul W.S. Anderson's Pompeii saw him delivering a sword and sandal slash disaster flick, the end result being a film which disappeared off the radar of most moviegoers as quickly as it appeared, especially with Anderson's dedication to the Resident Evil franchise once more seeing his work being branded all the same. But at the same time, would this be enough? Would it be too pop culture a take for the audiences wanting more history from the historical epic? I'm Elwood. I'm Kim. And you're listening to Movies and Tea. Let's take it to the booth. Okay, uh, well, welcome everyone. This is obviously the final episode of Movies and Tea. Season one. Of this season. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this season. Um, obviously, this season we have been looking at the filmography of Paul W. S. Anderson, and now we're here at the journey's end, marking the end of another civilization, so to speak, making it kind of fitting that obviously we're here at the end of our season and we're obviously talking tonight about Pompeii this is one of those films which I think people have a very set opinion of of it um, and at the same time it seems to like be very much under the radar for a lot of people when it comes to when we obviously talking about Paul W. S. Anson for all crew I mean most people are like if you say Paul W. S. Anson I mean they're either going to say like Resident Evil that some maybe will see like something like Death Race I think a few People, a few even less people may even say stuff like Event Rise and Mortal Kombat. So I very rarely hear anyone say, oh, Pompeii or Three Musketeers. So this is really sort of the dark territory of the filmography. And I know going into this, there was some some opinions already on what we were going to expect from this one. Um, well, I mean, it, it comes with the fact that, like, I think just because we're really honest here, that Pompeii was really on that kind of, maybe we don't want to go there ter- territory. <laughs> and then we had a whole debate about whether we would add it on or not since it kind of like tipped it over the amount of movies we wanted to cover in a season. Um, but in the end, we decided to do it just because, you know, it felt like the right way to, to end it just because like it would it would be like, okay, well, let's just cut that last one off because, you know, we have to be reviewing, you know, like... We have to review good and bad, no matter no matter what it is, and it, take an honest look at the filmography. I mean, with a lot of the past movies, uh, whether we re- revisited or we visited for the first time, whichever, we were able to find a link um, in Anderson's style and see how he added kind of like his flair to it, which made probably a movie that might not have been so good be a little bit better than it was. And, um, I mean... At least for myself, as I was starting this movie up for a second time, the first time being a viewing on a plane, that was what I was hoping I would get. Now, did I get that? We'll talk about that later, right? <laughs> and just about to say, I mean, you're obviously saying you saw this on a plane. I'm about to say that would be like the perfect setting to watch this movie. This movie's like very much like Three Musketeers. It's sort of like I'll watch it if it's on, but I'm not going to seek it to put it on. That would be my opening sort of thoughts on on this one. And it seems to be. Be the case with a lot of these later Anderson movies. I don't feel the same sort of excitement I feel for sort of like that early period and perhaps somewhere around the middle period. I mean, obviously, when we talk about films like Soldier and like uh, Death Race, I have that kind of excitement still for his, his for his films. But obviously, when we get into like the later films like Resident Evil Twenty Seven or you know this 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 film, it's sort of like there's some I don't know. It's why we have some sort of hesitation going into them. And I think whether it's just the fact that he'll try like a, an editing technique or a cinematic style and we somehow assume, at least in my case, that this is what we're going to get with this film. This is going to be like his new sort of dedicated style. I mean, certainly he'd, at this point in his career, he'd fallen in love with, with 3D filmmaking. This is his fourth film that he makes. he's made now in 3D. Um, he did two Resident Evil movies. He did Three Musketeers in 3D and then he did Pompeii in 3D as well. Um, however, when we're saying this is 3D, I mean, this isn't like James Cameron's Avatar 3D. This is sort of like, oh, we're going to make some cheap bucks uh, by putting it into 3D, style 3D. And certainly when I was watching this, I mean, I watched this in, you know, cheap-ass 2D, because I ain't going to shell out the extra to get a 3D set up here. Um, and I can honestly say it made like zero difference to my viewing experience to watch this in 2D. So, I mean, did you ever see it in 3D? I mean, no, I didn't. I yeah. mean, like I said, the first time was on a plane, which is obviously not. 
and um, the second time was in the comfort of my basement, which is not a 3D setup either. Uh, but, I mean, I feel a lot of movies do that now, and I tend to not go see 3D just because, you know, it's it's more expensive and it's not really, I don't know, a lot of times it's, it's really like for those three scenes where something's flying at your face. <laughs> you know, let's have a fireball fly at my face, and then... And then it'll emphasize on how inaccurate the volcano is erupting, right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, like, I don't know. Um, I mean, obviously, we kind of you kind of have an idea right now on how we're feeling about this movie. So, <laughs> let, let's start right away. Um, wh- what did you, I don't know, wh- what did you feel about this movie? Like, what are your first thoughts about it? Okay, I mean, I've actually deliberately like resisted putting my rating on Letterbox because this is a problem with you when you're obviously working together and you can see what people think of the film before you actually go to record it because you can see the Letterbox score. So to try and give the, some elements of surprises, I actually resisted putting everything on Letterbox for this one. But I don't know if this has come in a good mood or what, but I actually kind of enjoyed this viewing of Pompeii. I thought that it was a lot of fun um and it was kind of like gladiator light it was sort of like because gladiator is great but at the same time it's a little drawn out in places and you kind of when we think of gladiator there was a crow epic it's sort of like we think more about the fighty bits than the pondering like talky bits Mm -hmm. uh that sort of drag it out uh so obviously when you when you have Pompeii. It's it's a weird blend, first of all, because, I mean, this is a sword and sandal flick with a disaster flick. So it's pulling that Titanic trick where we're sort of turning up to see the boat sink, but at the same time, we're being forced to sit through like an hour or two of love story before we get to the bit we, we're paying our money to see. Pompeii is very much the same as we've got uh, Kit Harrison, who is a... Kit Harrington? Uh, Kit Harrington, sorry. Um, you know, old... Jon Snow himself. <laughs> it's so hard not to like think of Jon Snow whenever you watch this because he's essentially just doing the same role. But here he plays a um, a slave turned gladiator known as the Celt because you know that's the particular tribe he came to and they're real imaginative in this film. So he's basically become this invincible gladiator who's worked his way up the ranks and he finds himself brought to the city of Pompeii and trying to battle to win his freedom. At the same time, he catches the eye of uh, this wealthy merchant's daughter called uh, Cassia. Yeah, played by Emily Browning. And they form this very unlikely romance. I mean, this isn't just the fact that, you know, he's a gladiator. She's obviously of, of power and money and influence because even in a historical context, that would have made sense because gladiators were often hoard off to um ladies of of money because you know they were seen as these desirable specimens of manhood so that the connection there was easy to make but the meeting of these two characters is just so stupid that it means that the love story between these two makes absolutely zero no sense so in the meantime we've obviously got the corrupt roman senator here played by uh keeper Sutherland, Keeper Sutherland, Sutherland. Uh, Corbett, playing Corvus who I mean, he's basically sleepwalking his way through this, but he's sleepwalking his way in such, in such an entertaining ma- manner. He's sort of like so much presence in this film that he doesn't really need to try. He's sort of like that base level of evil, but beca- he's somehow managing to act above everyone else in the movie. Um, and obviously the uh, the big sort of finale, obviously, is the eruption of Pompeii, of Mount Vesuvius, I'm right in saying? Yeah. You see, my history, my, my history lessons really come into effect here now with this one. And uh, that basically just makes up the last sort of half hour or so as, you know, we see 200 plus extras running around while special effects and CGI get thrown around the screen. So, um, yeah, it's as I said, it's you basically get all the stuff that you wanted from Gladiator, but, you know, a little less runtime you get to cut in about an hour off, an hour and a half off your runtime. So I, for that respect, I, I kind of enjoyed it even though obviously Anderson isn't working at the same level as a master director like Ridley Scott is. And that really shows throughout many of the scenes here. But what we do get here is a very commonly directed film. It's not badly directed. It's just poorly scripted more than anything. And I think that's where it really breaks its own legs is the fact that the script is, 
the script that there's in the dialogue is fine. It's just <laughs> the actions and the way we get to certain moments is very poorly done. I, I honestly think it's not really, um, like, I think the whole, like, evil um, senator and that whole politics thing was okay. It, it was okay. And where it really falls apart is this kind of, like, really odd scenes that go on. Like, say, that love story is written really badly. Um, I mean, I'm not going to lie that what the only reason... I didn't know when I first watched Pompeii that, um, that it was Paul W. S. Anderson. And I mean, like, the plain time that I watched it. Mm, <laughs> I watched yeah. it because I had just watched a series of unfortunate events, um, the Jim Carrey version. And I really loved Emily Browning, and I wanted to see how she was after the whole child acting phase, you know? <laughs> and obviously, I'm not one of those people who like Sucker Punch. I actually think that's one of the movies we should actually discuss eventually. Uh, maybe in our, like, after hours thing that we were talking about before. Uh, but, like, so I, I really just went in for this. And I, I saw so many bigger names than I expected. Um, but I mean, like as much of a romantic as I was, oh my God, this love story was just like, oh, so bad, you know? And it was just, and, and, you know, on top of that, it was so expected. Like the only thing I remembered of Pompeii was the ending was because I thought the ending was so predictable that it was like so easy to know, oh, this is what they're going to do at the end as the volcano rushes in, you know, sort of type of thing. Because, you know, it's kind of like Titanic. You know what's going to happen. <laughs> there there yeah. really is there really is no, like, alternate path to this that's going to happen. Um, and I think that sometimes movies like that has that sort of crutch where if you don't treat it in the right way and you don't end it in the right way, then it becomes this kind of, like, forgettable mess um, in both a literal and, you know, figurative way. Um, so yeah, no, I thought, I thought this one was like, the disaster was done really well. I love the CGI and I thought it was really entertaining how everything was done. Even the most improbable part of the water coming in, like the whole tsunami coming in and a water block and a wall blocks it. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, even in the most improbable parts. Um, but that is, you know, I think it's, it's, it's kind of like. We haven't had really great disaster movies, so when we see disaster movies, it comes to be expected that you kind of have this suspension of belief, um, and this movie is kind of, like, sped up in the sense that, you know, Mount Vesuvius didn't have, like, fireballs shooting out in, like, a day. It probably took a while for the ashes to fall and for it to start erupting a little and shooting all kinds of stuff out and... You know, in real life, like, I was watching it with, um, you know, uh, I was watching it with my husband, and he was like, you know, lava should be moving much slower than this. And I was like, yeah, but how entertaining would that movie be? You know? <laughs> like, it'd be just creeping along slowly. It'd, it'd be a four-hour movie instead. Um, but no, I mean, like... Well... <laughs> but I mean, like, uh, yeah, I mean, Pompeii was, you know, that that's really... I mean, I'm not a big Gladiator fan. I, I already told you that before off air. Um, I'm not a huge Gladiator fan. Um, I don't know if it's the content because it's like super long, but also because I don't like Russell Crowe. So I never actually finished Gladiator. But uh, for what I remember of it, this one has like a lot of like bits of Gladiator in it. It's kind of like a crappy version of it, I guess. <laughs> um <laughs> But I, I do appreciate that Anderson um, obviously has a lot of, like, presence in this also. So, like, other than the fact that this is one of the few fim films that he didn't script, um, but uh, I guess that's where the quality drops. We, you know, fast forward to, like, <laughs> when we were talking about it and I think shopping and we were talking about how maybe he shouldn't script his own films. Now I take that all back. <laughs> <laughs> maybe he should script his own films <laughs> all the time. <laughs> Uh, he certainly got better as a writer. I think as he as he got more sort of confident as a writer, and you could tell as the film's obviously gone on, and certainly with the material he's dealing with, he's a very good sort of like uh, popcorn writer. 
So when you see him writing things like Death Race and Mortal Kombat and Resident Evil, these are very much his sort of real house. He doesn't write sort of heavy social things. And I think sometimes where shopping obviously stumbled is the fact that it's got all these social implications. It's got all these sort of character, these character interactions are supposed to have like more depth to them than um, I'm a bad guy. Arr, I'm a good guy. I'm going to spite you and one liners and that sort of thing. So that's sort of his wheel house. And that's nothing to obviously to take away from Anson because he, as I said, he's, he writes very visual cinema and that's obviously, um, and that's obviously something that he came to the wheelhouse. I mean, he's actually a big history fan. And he was, that's what drew him to the projects. He was very interested in the actual um, eruption of Vesuvius. And as you said, I mean, he didn't actually write the script for this, making it one of the more rarer properties, especially when you consider the fact that he's like written the stories for like the directed video um, sequels to Death Race. He's done the script for those. So, it's um, bizarre the fact that Pompeii was one that he chose actually not to um, actually do the actual script in for. I mean, um, the script for this one is, again, this was a screenplay by Johnny Scott, Scott Batchelor, Lee Batchelor, and Michael Robert Johnson. Uh, so three people there, and apparently between the three of them, none of them could really craft out a framework that didn't make you feel like you were watching a lighter version of Gladiator. I mean... The goal of the system, they even like do a borrow a joke from um, Gladiator in, cause in Gladiator. We have this scene where they recreate this famous battle where this army is like slaughtered um, horribly and they try to recreate the massacre of um, Kit's people. We see at the start of the start of the film. And um, of course, uh, being a heroic Gladiator, of course, he manages to rally all these oh it's like these uh gladiators together and defeat the overwhelming odds and like pull off this win and of course Kira Sullen goes oh my history might be a little off but I'm sure we won this battle of course copying that same joke from gladiator and I think that kind of stood out it's like oh that was a bit stupid um at the same time we've got his sort of like best friend and rival sort of gladiator shall we speak who's supposed to be like carving through this post which I'm not sure he's supposed to be made of stone or wood, but when he's hacking away at it with his big battle axe, it's very clearly polystyrene. <laughs> um, and that was really sort of glaring. It's like, you kind of like clean that up a little bit in post-production. Um, you know, I don't have that much problems with all these like weird things that don't work um, in the fighting and the action scene. I think that those were the better scenes in the film. That and the disaster were the better scenes in the film. Yeah. Whereas, like, you know, what, you know, I couldn't stop laughing was that the scenes sometimes are so slow. Even in, like, those urgent situations when, like, the volcano is coming at you and you got to get to the harbor to leave or something, right? And you just see these two, like, um, uh, the gladiator's frenemy, I guess, um, Atticus, <laughs> and they every time they talk they have this like lingering stare afterwards and <laughs> they, and it's just the same conversation all the time at the beginning they would have the same conversation about oh i'm going to kill you tomorrow and i'm gonna kill you tomorrow <laughs> and you know and i'm gonna do this in this way but i'm gonna kill you and it's just this conversation revolving around this whole conversation and they would have these like slow talk and it would be just lingering, like, facial expressions and little smirks and stuff like that. And it was like, yo, man, this bromance there is really, really ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it is, right? But at the same time, I mean, this film works, it works really well. Yeah. Like, the opening where we see, like, the slaughter of the court, yeah. the, the county horsemen, and, like, you see the young uh Milo. Um like one dra- walk out and it's just like this battlefield and I was like, Oh that's just my my everyday morning that is and then we cut to like him and he's like waking up in like all the bodies. Um because I mean, I don't know, some of us have all been there where you just wake up in the <laughs> pile of bodies in the morning, but 
um, I really love the the opening. I mean, it sets everything up so perfectly. Yeah, and 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 you know that scene also had like I, what I really loved about that scene, other than like what you're talking about, was the fact that he wakes up by these like um, dangling swords and like in in the tree above. And he just yeah. looks up, and these these like hit, and it's like his father and all the all the horsemen that were slaughtered, like hung on the tree. And I thought that that scene was so nice. And I think that what really like we always talk about this in every single episode. I think we talked about it, and it's how Anderson really brings this really lovely sort of way of just filming, like his cinematography, his style, like the things he captures the scenes. They're always done so well, just building that atmosphere, building that sort of tone, and and it goes all the way to like even those like that like volcano erupting and that that progression of the events and stuff like that. Um, like even when you go into the city of Pompeii, you know we still see that flicker of his love of maps and kind of have that map where he travels from like Rome all the way to like um, Pompeii, and you go in and there's this. And there's this, like, signature bird's eye view overhead where you just kind of, like, sail across and you see this whole landscape of Pompeii. And I think that, like, you know, the credit to Anderson is really, like, how he makes this film, like, as scripted poorly as it is, visually, I, th- I thought it was really, really nice to look at. Like, it, it was, there were so many things to love about just the setup of the whole thing. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, certainly, as you said, all the trademarks are pretty much there. You've got, obviously, like the God's Sight view. You've got the centralized framing of shots. And certainly when we look at the Tree of Woe there, and I mean, that's some real sort of like stamina and breaking it off when you not only slaughter the people, but then you're going to take the time to hang them in a tree with their weapons beside them. I mean, that's just like some real dedication to shoving it in your enemies' faces. We just trash your ass. <laughs> So that was really cool. And it's a really visual, good shot. We obviously get obviously, the symmetry uh, when we have like the Centurions marching into the Colosseum. It's just like these little flares that you obviously pick. Once you know that they're there and you can spot them in each of his films, it's really great to see them. I think the only one that we didn't really see um, this time was just sort of like the endless corridors. The and I was surprised, I mean, obviously, the amount of time that we spend around this Colosseum. I mean, <laughs> Vesuvius is erupting, and we've escaped the Colosseum. So what our first instinct is, is, oh, let's run back to the Colosseum to get horses. And you're thinking there's not, like, a stable or, you know, just some other place we can find horses, rather than go to the Colosseum, which only seems to serve the purpose to have him re-encounter our two main sort of bad guys of, of this yeah. piece. Um, and to set up the the over dramatic uh, chariot race through the burning streets of uh, Pompeii <laughs> and, and, then, and, and then that epic thing that you can, if you ever got caught in handcuffs, you can take a piece of wood and it you will unlock it. <laughs> yeah. You know, I I don't know. I mean, whoever script this and green lit the script, I, I don't know. I don't know what to say. Like, I mean, <laughs> there are so many like. I don't know, just, it's it's hard to comprehend that people actually thought that this was a clever way, that this was like, I don't know, I don't know what to think about, like, the script is just so many plot holes and so many issues with it that it's hard to kind of, like, turn away from any of that, I don't know. Yeah, I, I think this is the problem you have, is that you have these... You have a very capable actors. I mean, no one's especially a bad actor in in this whole yeah. thing. And I mean, certainly um, in Spanish, in the case of uh, of Kit Harrington, who I mean, he's he's completely jacked yeah. in this role. And I mean, his whole role, reason for saying signing to the film is that he wanted to do one of those roles where he had to go for a body metamorphosis, so to like you know get bulked up for a role. Um, unfortunately he got like really into it and he was going like to the gym like six days a week, three times a day and his trainer actually highlighted the fact that when he had like worn himself down to exhaustion that he was actually suffering from body dysmorphia um, and that he you know he just needed to ease off um, because he was like determined just like get himself in such great shape and certainly when we look at um, the shape he's in when he walked in when we get the money shot at the start when he's walked in in the the armor which is cut in all the right places. <laughs> um, 
it, it certainly uh, pays off. And I think, as I said, it's, it's hard to distinguish this between him and when he's obviously playing Jon Snow because they are very similar sort of roles. He's sort of like, oh, I'm sort of like, you know, I'm the humble warrior, I know. And a just, man of few words, you know, but... Yeah, he's, he's sort of like, if Hugh Grant got in a lot of sword fights, he would be he would be that sort of... would be uh, the Kit Harrington character in this. He's sort of like, I just, just fumble around, and you know, I, but I can kick a lot of ass, and Certainly when we look at the fight scenes in, in this production, and this is something that's always been frequently pointed out, is that you can tell how skilled the performers are by how close the camera is and how many cuts there are in a sequence. So if a performer is particularly skilled, such as we often see like in Hong Kong cinema um, and like Shaw Brothers, you will see the wide frame lens and they will have very few cuts and just have like a fixed camera. Uh, so when we look at things such as like Jackie Chan's like Snake and Eagle Shadow, you have that fixed camera and you watch the two performers who will be battling back and forth across the screen. In here, we've got sort of a camera where we get quite a lot of shots where we get to see full body shots and they incorporate a lot of sh uh, close up shots as well. But it's not shot with any of the sort of franticness, frankly, of Resident Evil, the final chapter. He allows these sequences to breathe and we can see what pe what's actually supposed to be happening on the screen. and the actual fight uh, choreography is really sort of satisfying. There are obviously moments in it which did obviously raise grumbles for myself that, you know, things such as, like, axes being thrown, <laughs> thrown that way you know, aren't going to have that effect. Every time someone throws a spear, it's, like, essentially the same as if I threw a broom handle at you. <laughs> it's, sort of like, it's sort of like that has no power or effect whatsoever. It just seems like this flimsy pole that's being thrown across rather than anything that's got any sort of, like, force behind it. Um, so those those was kind of lacking, but you know, whenever we got someone involved in sword play uh, in this film, it's all very interesting. Certainly, when we have the, especially in the opening gladiatorial sequence where it's all rain soaked, and you've got like the blood dripping off the weapons, and you've got these three sort of gladiators who are basically, I mean, from what we can tell, they've been on the winning end until obviously Kit Harrington comes in and just like completely butchers uh, the ball, but. <laughs> It's so cool to see like a gladiator sequence in rain. Yeah. Because that's not normally yeah, yeah. it's just obviously in like daylight or it's in is it never in like the rain and the rain effects really sort of add that extra little edge to uh, what we're seeing and I think it's again just that credit to the visual style of Anderson mm -hmm. and for the reason why now so many people are going back and reevaluating his work as a visual director um, rather than just sort of like before they were always sort of kind of dismissed him because he's not writing highbrow projects. It's not like, you know, Scott or Kubrick or like one of those directors where he's writing sort of very highbrow and all that pieces. They're appreciating it on the visual level. So like we would with someone like Gondry or um, Cop Sophia Coppola or Darren and Aronofsky. So that sort of um, director they're now viewing him as being. So, and uh, when you look at scenes like this, it's hard not to fault his skill as a director it's just unfortunate that he doesn't always have the best scripts to work with but <laughs> i i honestly like i don't really have a lot to say about pompeii i think it's a really straightforward film like most disaster <clears throat> films are um like i would really like to see him do a, another disaster film but without the Without the over drama, you know, like all this like badly scripted drama and all that stuff that's going on, something a little bit more like flat out disaster. Because I think he would really be able to make something really great out of it. That's something that I I, I think would would be like I don't know. I thought that the disaster part was really competent. Like, um, I mean the Pompeii thing erupting and stuff like that. It it worked so well yeah. for what it was. Like visually, I, I loved how it was constructed and how it was put together and just the progress of it and um, the whole development of each of the scenes and how it was put together and all that stuff. But, I mean, the really the real thing that lets it down is, is just like we keep saying, it's the script. It's how, you know, uh, it's just the progression and the pacing of these scenes that are happening and how it oddly, like, it doesn't, it feels like a few disjointed stories pushed together. And they never really, like, seem to work really well. And nothing seems to make a lot of sense. Yeah. 
I can understand what you're saying, but at the same time, I'm kind of like thinking, if I'm going to have to have a disaster flick and something, I kind of prefer that oh, I'm going to have a gladiatorial flick and a disaster movie rather than I'm going to have a drawn-out love story, which makes absolutely zero sense, and a disaster flick. Um, I mean, I don't... That was the thing which always annoyed me with, with Titanic, is the fact that I have to sit through two-plus hours of of this unlikely and very unprobable romance uh, between Kate Winslet and Leonardo DiCaprio's characters. They make doe eyes and yeah. run around the script and act without in this world where they're completely free of the rules which seem to be binding every other character. Whereas here, it's sort of like, we're building up to the volcano, but at mm-hmm. the same time, you know, what I'm getting to see is largely entertaining. I'm getting to see, you know, people <laughs> fighting and, and killing true, and, true. you know, action, which is certainly a more enjoyable way I'm going to build up yeah. than sort of if I have to watch Kat Harrington and uh, no, and, no, no. Uh, I, I, I making I, Doe Eyes. So like, like, no, no, no. I, I, that's, what I, that's what I don't want. Like, if, if I, I wanted Anderson to, if, if I would want is Anderson to make something that's like no love story in it. Like, without that kind of like, I, I know they have to do something like that, I guess. It's it, it's kind of yeah. like, you know, they really wanted to give that maybe kind of like a draw for, I don't know, women to go, go watch it. But then, I mean, Kit Harrington is enough of a draw, I think. Him and his, like, I don't know, six-pack or whatever packs he has. Um, I mean, if that doesn't draw you in enough, I don't really know what else will. <laughs> he was, like, super ripped. Do you think that's why I'm... Um, I mean... Do you think that's why I'm... Um... Luna Jovanich wasn't cast in this film because I mean, I mean, if I'd say he stole, he well, I don't want to say he stole Luna Jovanich off uh, Luc Besson because she herself says that when she met Anderson, she was like so obsessed with me, was like I have to be with this man. Um, so we're not going to say that he stole her off Luc Besson, but it's sort of like you're kind of like oh, I've got my attractive wife, but do I really want to put her with a younger model of me? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Either way, I mean, final thoughts. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I, I don't know whether I just watched this in, in a better mood or, or what, but I actually, or just knew what I was going to get into because obviously, when you go into Pompeii, you think, oh, I'm just going to watch, you know, a bunch of people get covered in in ash. You know, maybe I'll find out what the deal with that dog that uh, appears to be cleaning itself while the guy watches is is about. But uh, no, it, it, you know, it. <sighs> As I said, the the worst ways to build up to your your big climax than than having gladiatorial combat. I think that's only one of the better things you can do with your time. I mean, what the alternative was, we have with some version of like Roman version of like volcano where we've got like some architects in the cities like trying to convince officials that the volcano is going to erupt and they're all naysaying him. I think that's the only way you could have gone and. I don't know if if I really wanted to to watch that movie. I think maybe I just enjoy it just on its very visual and visceral sort of styling that it has, and it delivers in both its aspects, both as a sword and sandal flick, and both as a disaster flick. I'm both satisfied with that. So, um, well, again, like Three Musketeers, it's not the sort of film I'm going to like rush to put on. Um, if it's on, then I if, like if I'm on a plane or it happens to be on while I'm scanning channels, then yeah, I'd sit down and watch this again, certainly. But what about yourself, Kim? Um, I yeah, I mean, I I probably wouldn't willingly go and watch it again. Um, I mean, like I said, uh, disaster was great. The battles were great. Um, the script and the love story was kind of cringy. Um, not not a big fan. Um, I mean, I would definitely pick anything over Pompeii in the Anderson category. (laughs) Uh, I mean, it's not a, you know, the second viewing, I have to say, though, I did appreciate it for um, the visuals and stuff a lot more than the first one, first time I watched it. And it it largely has to do with the fact that, you know, a good visual movie on a plane is a horrible idea. (laughs) I mean, I watched Hugo on the plane the first time, and uh, that was a bad idea. Because it's a great movie, and you shouldn't have done that. Um, just a quick example. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, Pompeii, I really love the cast. I love, like, the evil Keith or Sutherland that made me want to punch him in the face because he was really annoying. Um, but his character was meant to do that, you know? And uh, you had some, you know, that there was a nice, like, variety in the characters. It was just the way they were written, which left a little bit to be desired. 
Um, I mean, that's, that's it, you know, like, everything really wasn't bad. It was just, like, the script that really let it down and the pacing of it and, and how things, like, kind of fitted together that really, like, left kind of, like, it had potential, but it never really got to that potential because of that. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's how I feel about it. Um, obviously, Anson is got, currently only got one film scheduled at the moment, which is the, another video game adaptation. <laughs> He's doing Monster Hunter, um, again, teaming up with his wife, who's been confirmed as being cast. I don't think anyone was surprised at that casting at the same time. It's no one's really complaining at the same time, because we all like to see her playing the action roles. Yeah. Um, from what we know at the moment, it's going to see an American, that's all we know about it, uh, being dragged into parallel universe uh, that the series is set in and learning how to fight monsters. Um, yeah. So it's, um, yeah, the, the moment there's a rumor is that there's going to be a final climactic battle that's going to take place in the real world at the LA International Airport. Um this is really also tying it into this current trend in anime where we have real people, sort of like the nerdy guy or nerdy girl, dragged into the MMO world of the game they're obsessed with um, and suddenly, of course, being this chosen one style character. And we saw it in things such as like Sword Art Online. And it seems to be this real sort of trend, this sort of like <laughs> this geek masturbatory fantasy of like, all those useless hours that you wasted on this game are now going to like serve a purpose of, and not be about you just spending all this time in your bedroom by yourself that, you know, is all set, all about building up. And it's kind of like that last Starfighter vibe, um, just obviously giving that more modern twist. And it seems to be what they're going with, with Monster Hunter, uh, which I suppose is a good way to go. I I don't know. I mean, would you prefer like a more sort of traditional sort of like, kind of like Willow where we're in a fantasy world and you know these things exist and we're going to be a fledgling hunter going out and and learning the the skills of being a monster hunter I I don't know I mean I I don't I don't mind I don't mind that story at all I mean um I I have like really good faith in how uh he's going to bring this story to life I mean if anything like Anderson's accomplished a lot in the Resident Evil like, I know a lot of people don't agree with me, but he's accomplished a lot more than um, would have been expected. And yeah. uh, regardless of that, or, or, you know, like Mortal Kombat was, you know, a success. And, um, you know, there were many things that he adds to a, a, a movie, which really works. And because he has a love for the video game world, I really think he's going to be able to create some really nice vision. I'm not, I've never played Monster Hunter um, but I do want to play Monster Hunter World because apparently it's incredibly fantastic. Um, so maybe like keep your eyes peeled on this shameless plug for our other podcast, Game Warp, that maybe if we find enough money, we'll play that game <laughs> and we'll buy it. We'll play it. Yeah. As with anything, you buy it, we'll play it. <laughs> that's, that's basically how we roll. Down in the, uh, Especially the triple A game world is uh it's like super expensive. So <laughs> for yeah. for future for future view for further viewing, what would you pair with um Pompeii? Oh yeah. Um okay, so with with Pompeii, I mean it's it's really a number of different angles you can go go with this one. I mean obviously if you want a good volcano flick, I mean you've got two absolute great um films which were released in the same year. And that would be either you could go with Dante's Peak or Volcano. I think both obviously are modern day films, but they both do the Volcano shtick really well. Um, if you want more Sword and Sandal, I think myself, I think it's going to be either a case of if you watch the first Conan the Barbarian film. Um, if you want a little more Sword and Sorcery edge to it, you watch Conan the Destroyer, which I personally prefer, but um, certainly the the Barbarian um, and certainly the gladiatorial angle is definitely more in the first one. Um, and I would also recommend like Ridley Scott's unofficial Sword and Sandals trilogy, which is uh, made up of Gladiator, Kingdom of Heaven, and Black Hawk Down. That trilogy is just, just absolutely fantastic. And as I said, certainly when you look at like Gladiator and Kingdom of Heaven, you're getting certainly uh, plenty of really exciting fighty bits that... Uh, 
you obviously get get this film as well. So it's it uh, depends on what which part of the film you want more of, really, for my sort of picks. But I mean, Kim, what would you sort of view for your favorite viewing? Um, I kind of went the route of um more of a disaster flick. So, um, I mean, for me, I thought about kind of like, uh, I, I went in the way of, you know, something like, uh, San Andreas or something with, um, with, uh, The Rock. I, yeah. I really don't know. I mean, or you'd watch something really like pure disaster, like the day after tomorrow. You don't have a volcano eruption or anything, but it is a disaster flick and, um, I mean, people have mixed views about San Andreas, but I thought it was a pretty enjoyable, entertaining film. Um, you know, it's nothing masterful. It's a disaster flick. No, you know. <laughs> it's a da- disaster flick. What do you expect? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, well, I actually, as I was watching this, I also thought about, like... So, yeah, I mean, other than that, I thought about... Um, I thought about uh, Journey to the Center of... Journey to the Center of the Earth. Um, I mean, that one had that kind of, like, 3D element to it. Um, it had some sort of adventure. There was a little bit of kind of, like, a disaster-y thing, sort of thing. Um, I think it could be a good, good pairing, too. You know, a little bit of fantasy. And uh, that's it for me. I really I really don't know. <laughs> yeah. This was a tough one to pair. Okay. It was, yeah, I mean, it, it's certainly one of the more unique ones, but... Yeah, I mean, this obviously brings us the end of our our time with Paul W. Sanson. It's it's been a it's been an experience to say the least. I mean, we've had some we've had some highs, we've had some laughs, had a few lows. Um, but yeah, I feel that I mean, do you, having worked our way for the filmography now, I mean, are you now more a fan of Anson's work? Are you still the same? I mean, where do you? sort of stand now that you've seen seen the range um I definitely would say I'm more of a fan I've always been a fan so I've I've appreciated his work even more now um like visually I think that he's really competent even like written some like a lot of times when he's scripting uh even co-scripting and stuff like that uh the movie works works to its favor because he has the vision of what he wants to do really well um, and, and that matches his style. So, yeah, I definitely like him more. Like, I really, th- I, I look forward to seeing more of his stuff. How about you? Uh, yeah, I think, um, for myself, I found that the stuff away from the Resident Evil franchise is probably some of my more favorite stuff. Um, and I think it's really just the last chapter. The last chapter in particular just, like, kind of tainted me on that whole, aspect of it. I mean, obviously, he's certainly what he did with the Resident Evil franchise. He did, started off as, he, as a video game adaptation, and then he took it and really ran with the idea and took it in some, like, really unique worlds. A very improbable end game, uh, where when we actually found out the actual, what we've been building up to, like, the reason for this, uh, these events, it seemed like, as you pointed out, it seemed like, oh, that doesn't really work well. Um, but certainly when we look at his more one-shot sort of productions, um, such as, like, Mortal Kombat and Soldier and um, Death Race, there's some really interesting uh, stuff there. And certainly, I think, visually, uh, as a visual director, I, I appreciate him more. I still wouldn't say he's still, like, up there in my top echelon of directors, but certainly as a as a visual director, I've certainly come to appreciate his style more. Um then obviously just dismissing him just on the basis of I think like a lot of people do the fact that he made so many Resident Evil movies it's so like why why are you so obsessed with making these movies it's like are there not other stories you want to tell but when you see you look at the whole of the saga of Resident Evil and just where it went and certainly when you consider what he may have done with like Alien vs Predator or Death like if he had had more hands on approach with like Death Race um what he could obviously, have, what he could have obviously done with those franchises as well, it would have kind of been interesting to see how he developed those worlds. But um, alas, it was not to be. Um, but I mean, if we were to pick three films, we pick one to our like our shining example. This is our a number one film for Paul Dorrance. What would you say is your your top pick? 
the movie that started this podcast, Event Horizon. Hands down. Event Horizon. Yeah. Okay. Um, for myself, it's still Mortal Kombat. I don't care if it's, it's people want to say it's stupid or or what, but I love Mortal Kombat. And I think certainly when you listen back to that episode, um, once you when once you get under the fact that it's just pure nerding out on on that series, just there's so many fun elements and. I loved it when I was a kid, and it was just like fun sleepover fodder. And I love it now as an adult going back to it. It's just, as I said, it's just Enter the Dragon, but with fantastical elements. And I think that's why it works so well. Is mm-hmm. that it doesn't need to do anything overly complicated. We just need to see a reason for these fighters to be battling each other, mm-hmm. and that's what it delivers. And uh, yeah, I would say Event Horizon would be a, certainly a, another pick up there for myself. Um, <sighs> It's good that Event Horizon is still as good as I remembered it being. Yeah. Um, yeah. Would you want to see the harder cut he originally planned for it? Because I know a lot of people complain that it's it's too soft. I mean, he obviously went out, as we discussed on, as I said on the episode, that he set out to make a really hard uh, sci-fi horror film. And it was really just the studio that cut it back. So, I mean, would you want to see the hard cut? Yeah, I'm sure. Sh- I'm, like... I, I would want to see it. it. It would be interesting to see, like, what was the original cut, like, kind of like the director's cut of how well, how he envisioned the film to turn out. Because, I mean, the film itself right now, I really love it for what it is. Um, it's more of a thriller than kind of like a gory horror. It still has, like, those yeah. horror elements in it. And it's more psychological. And that's really, like, my wheelhouse. I really love films like that. Um, so, but, I mean... I really love to see what his vision of it originally was before, you know, the studio kind of, like, cut back on that sort of thing. Um, yeah, it'd be interesting. Cool. Um, now, <laughs> the hidden gem of the filmography. What would you say is his most unappreciated film? Unappreciated. Um, I would, I'm going for more of, like, maybe unappreciated and kind of unknown. Uh, okay. I would say shopping. I think shopping's, uh, like, I really liked, I, like, I can't say, like, I love shopping a lot, but yeah. I thought that shopping was a really good debut for him. Um, there was this kind of, like, you saw, like, this depth that he had uh, when he first started and, like, the voice that he had. And obviously that wasn't the voice that he continued to have now later in his career. It's more of, like, straightforward stories that he's telling. But... It kind of, like, built a lot of his style back then. He really saw, like, a lot of, like, you know, um, back in the podcast, I talked about it when we were doing shopping, where there were these, like, really great shots of, like, just the car ch- car chases. Um, there were some great shots on just, like, building that atmosphere and feeling that, like, that world of being in that underground world of London. And uh, that sort of thing has really worked. Like, that, the contrast he has and, you know the windy, the long, endless corridor stuff, and, you know, that sort of thing. Like, he, it, it, as a starting point, it's something that I feel is worth looking at, especially if all you see in Anderson is Resident Evil, Um, then this is a good spot to go back and see that, you know, this director started off really strong as well. Like, there were obvious flaws in shopping, but... Um, I don't think a lot of people know about it. And and I think that that's one of the reasons why it's kind of underappreciated. Yeah, I was really not sure what you make of shopping. Because, I mean, it is a slower-paced film. But certainly when you compare it to the other films in his filmography, I mean, it's very sort of, very dialogue-driven. And the fact that when you watch the trailer, you think, oh, it's going to be like this balls to the wall, like Fast and Furious style action movie. We're going to be like ram raiding and we're going to have car chases and uh, fighting and it's actually like no you have these three set pieces and then you have a lot of like dialogue and um, sort of politics within this sort of world um, that sort of unfold obviously between like Jude Law's character and, um, and certainly how he interacts with other sort of characters trying to make the way out of the situation I thought it's, it's very interesting and certainly when we looked at the films in the filmography it's amazing how many times they come back to shopping is like the, the producer saw saw shopping and was like, you know, this is why we wanted to bring Anson in and certainly opened a lot of doors for him in Hollywood. Um, I can't help but wonder if it had been more of a success on its release, 
if he would have gone turned up and been like the Danny Boyle style director, he would have just made those sorts of films and just been like very sort of like very sort of like society based yeah. sort of yeah. films rather than more sort of like studio um sort of Hollywood blockbusters sort of some of popcorn flicks. some of popcorn yeah. sort of flicks that he obviously sort of went, moved on to and what he's probably best known for, where people just made sort of like more uh sort of like society sort of based films like uh Danny Boyle obviously did with like things like Shadow Grave and Train Spotting and um that sort of mm-hmm. um how about your hidden gem uh, my hidden gem for myself is Soldier right that was uh, my second choice it was a debate between shopping and Soldier Soldier is just it's this wonderful little it's like an 80s action movie um and at the same time you've got this wonderful performance by Kate Russell who speaks about five lines in the whole film uh, just this idea of this this uh, guy who's been hardwired wa- from childhood to be a killing machine. Like, when we see the opening sequence and they're going through the different wars and all the different training and the fact that you, they're breaking these children down and they're turning them into this, these cold, emotionless killing machines and the idea that they're now being replaced and he's he's like <laughs> very gracefully and literally thrown on the junk pile and that he's like having to learn how to reconnect with society and find his way in the world. Um, and yeah, it, it's got obviously those, when we get into the second half of that movie, it just becomes like a fun sort of 80s action movie homage. It's just, there's great fun there, but just like the build up to that finale is just a lot of fun as well. And I think it's just really helped by the fact that Kerry Russell's so good in that film. It's a real sort of change of pace for him. He's not just a tough guy he's sort of like the emotionless um uh, and wordless tough guy he's all about his performance how he puts himself across and i think that's what makes it so special and it's a shame it's been sort of forgotten really i mean i don't think they've even updated the dvd it's still a flipper as we got way <laughs> too excited about finding that for so trust me and and i mean like you think we were excited everybody there, a lot of people were excited about it <laughs> <laughs> yeah um so uh, if you want to see some serious nerd now, just see if we go to our Facebook page or our Instagram and look for that flipper and you can see some people getting very excited about that. There's some real good DVD nostalgia talk on that one. <laughs> and uh, obviously for the third pick, we're looking at the worst of the filmography that we covered. And um, what was yours? For myself, it's Resident Evil, the final chapter. You can just burn this with fire. There's like, just I just there's no words to encapsulate the rage I felt watching this movie, and it's really down to the editing. I mean, it, there's a good film to be found in there, but this film is edited like a, like they gave the film to a kid with OCD on the ups and downs of sugar binge. Nothing ever stays on the screen more than like two seconds, and it's shot at such close proximity. Like every action scene is just so frantically paced, and the fact that you have Colin Salmon, um, <laughs> who should just like just never be anywhere near film. Um, <laughs> it was bad enough the fact he was in the first film, but at least he had the dignity to kill him off in the first quarter. <laughs> to actually have him as like a a main protagonist was just like excruciating. And uh, I mean, he was bad enough he turned up in Alien vs Predators, but. <laughs> at least he got killed off in that as well but mm-hmm. no it was there was just so many issues i mean even the end game which you pointed out and i, I think when you point out the the floor in the end game for the resident evil franchise it just like broke it did it i like, you know, this, did that, i did i point out a flaw because i i honestly um i don't i i don't have a lot of hatred for resident evil um i accept it for exactly what it is um mm. And I actually like the final chapter a lot more than, uh, say, if I were to say, like, Afterlife would be the one I hated the most. Um, I know you have big issues with editing. I've never had issues with editing with it. Like, I don't notice these things. I I thought it was fine. Like, it didn't bother me that much. Um, But then I'm kind of, like, I'm really skewed when it comes to Resident Evil, and I know that. Um, Like, for myself, I thought, like, the only reason... um, you know, we were talking about the lessons learned and why we shouldn't binge watch 
six Resident Evil films in one shot. And um, the reason I did it was because I wanted to see if the end game made sense at the end. If that makes any sense. I felt like I just repeat, yeah. repeated a sentence. Um, and, I mean, for the most part, the story does place itself well together because it kind of like moves from one scene to the next and one movie and the kind of like timeline shifts all right um the final chapter maybe there was a little bit of discretion um and it could have come down to the editing um but i thought it was all right like it was the ending um i know they had a lot of problems with the filming so there's probably a lot of reasons behind why they shot it that way and just all these technical issues that happened during the filming probably uh, I don't have much defense for it. It's it's Resident Evil. You know, you either like it or you hate it. <laughs> um, oh, I think uh, I think as time's gone on, my appreciation for the franchise has certainly increased from what from when I watched the first film and got really sort of angry about the fact that it, that they would cut away as soon as anything good was going to happen on the screen. But as we've seen, obviously, the way the character of Alice has evolved in over the course of the film, what Melina Jovanich has done with the character, in certainly really embracing it and making it her own. Um, and I think re-watching Resident Evil, knowing what I'm going to get, that it's essentially a starter zombie movie. And that it's doing it, its own thing um, has certainly made me appreciate it more. Um, yeah, certainly the, the franchise has its duff entries, as any long franchise yeah. running does. But I mean, when we look at like part three and four has its has its moments which are still pretty good. Five um five is just an, is just an excuse just to, <laughs> to throw action at the screen and, and six. I, I and love five. Kind of... Five is five is like hands down my like second favorite um Resident Evil. Um even even though in fact it has zombies driving like cars and motorcycles and stuff. I don't, I don't know. I mean I thought it was like just this like you know, mindless entertainment that really works. Like, it was a direction that really worked for what this franchise was heading down the road for. And, um, I mean, with that said, this is really stretching out. <laughs> my yeah. my worst film was, you know, I it's obvious what it is because I we just talked about it, and it's Pompeii. Um, I thought that the ki- no matter how great different parts were and how sufficient and pot- there was so much potential... What kills a film worse than anything in my mind is throwing like throwing away all the potential it could have had to be a good film. And that was a script. Um, the script really made me not enjoy it. And like I guess I enjoyed it because I had a fun time making fun of the movie, but I'm sure making fun of the movie was not intended <laughs> to be the enjoyment of it. Um, so yeah, I mean we are we already talked like, 30 minutes on Pompeii, so I'm not going to elaborate on my point anymore. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, here we are, as I said, here we are at the end of, the, the end of uh, this this season. Mm-hmm. We've uh, seen two civilizations eradicated. We've seen experiments in, in 3D technology, a zombie uprising, various visions of the future, and tournaments enacted, and... Uh, yeah, it's certainly been a it's certainly been a, an interesting ride. I mean, I would hope that over the course of this season that we may we've raised some interest some points uh, of uh, a Paul W. Sense's work and maybe challenged a few people's opinions to go back and reevaluate what what they thought of the director. Maybe we've highlighted a few things to look out for on rewatches. Um, we'd love to hear you obviously your feedback. If uh, leave us some leave us some uh, comments you can do on facebook or itunes or podomatic uh wherever you happen to be listening to this podcast uh at the same time please do hit the subscribe button it really does help um and we do appreciate that um we are obviously going to be taking a little bit of a break in the meantime we do have a couple of after hours episodes uh which will be our sort of sub series to our main seasons where we'll be looking at films of interest to ourselves or our guests or just you know those films where we don't really feel the need to go back and revisit the whole filmography of, of that particular director so we've got a couple of those episodes coming up uh but should we reveal who we're going to be looking at in season two 
uh, yeah, in season two, we're going to be looking at uh, Guillermo del Toro. Uh, if you uh, like our Facebook or our Twitter, I would say, um, we should be updating our Facebook very soon with the new list after this, uh, obviously after this episode sits for a little bit and shortly you will see in the banner what, um, I think it's eight films that we're covering yep. um, on Guillermo del Toro's um uh, filmography. I don't have the list here, so we're, you, it'll be a surprise to everyone. <laughs> 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 yeah, so that's going to be fun. I mean, obviously, Guillermo del Toro is known for um, Pan's Labyrinth and Pacific Rim and that sort of stuff, uh, but like more widely known. Um, but, you know, we're going to start from the beginning, just like with Paul W.S. Anderson, and we're going to see uh, where he started and the films that uh, turned him into the director that is today, which earned him an Oscar winning movie. Yeah, I think Del Toro again, another visual director. And we're obviously starting with Kronos, so his unique take on the vampire movie. And I mean, Del Toro, I mean, he's the, the Spanish monster kid, um, a visual director who loves practical effects. And I think it's going to be interesting to see the evolution of his work as a director. I mean, the fact that he's also a director who works in both the Hollywood system, producing English films uh, with an indie sort of slant to them, at the same time producing Spanish language films as well. So mm -hmm. he plays both sides of the films, making him a very unique director. Um, and we're those few directors who plays both sides, because when we have, once a director comes over to Hollywood, then that's where they tend to remain or they go back to their homeland and make uh does make return to making films there so del toro i mean he was one of those directors we when he came out we just thought he would be like another horror cool horror director but i mean obviously more recently he's won a oscar nomination oscar uh for best director and now he's sort of the directors everyone wants to talk about so it's gonna be really fun to go back and uh chart his evolution as a director so uh yeah season two we will uh be Talk about Guillermo del Toro. Uh, but in the meantime, you can obviously catch up with the whole of season one and all our episodes via our blog, which is movies and tea podcast .wordpress .com. Um So if you've missed any episodes of state, uh, make sure you go there and uh, and uh, check uh, check this out. But um, until uh, next time, I'd like to obviously thank my co host, Miss Kim Lowe. Yay, thank you. <laughs> and uh, this is, of course, Zelda Jones signing off another edition of uh, Movies and Tea. And uh, wishing you all a good night.